From the pinnacle of music moguldom to the depths of celebrity scandal, welcome to Watch Mojo. And today, we're taking a deep dive into the incredible rise and fall of Sean Diddy Combs. And we're starting with a timeline that explains it all. I have different personalities, you know what I'm saying? Nobody knows who's coming downstairs in the morning. Sean Diddy Combs is one of the richest and most influential figures in music. He's a multimedia mogul with endless connections in the entertainment industry. But in 2024, his story took a much darker turn. From his $48 million Miami mansion to hell on earth where chaos reigns. Combs became embroiled in scandal as multiple allegations of historic sex offenses were leveled against him. He was arrested and charged with racketeering conspiracy, sex trafficking by force, fraud or coercion, and transportation to engage in prostitution. So how did he get to this point? Welcome to Watch Mojo. And today we're taking a closer look at the timeline of Sean Diddy Combs, charting his 1990s rise to his 2020s disgrace. Combs was born in Harlem in 1969. His mother was a teaching assistant. His father was in the US Air Force. His father also had ties to a notorious New York drug lord, however, Frank Lucas, and was shot dead in 1972 when Combs was two years old. From there, Combs moved through school and attended Howard University, where he majored in business, but eventually dropped out to pursue a career in music. In 2014, he returned to Howard to receive an honorary degree and to deliver that year's commencement address. That degree was revoked, though, in 2024. In 1990, Combs gained an internship at Uptown Records and quickly rose within the label. It was around this time that his reputation for hosting huge parties also emerged. In 1991, a charity fundraiser organized by Combs attracted almost double capacity for the venue, which resulted in a terrifying crush and what came to be known as the City College Stampede, where nine people were killed. The event in question was a celebrity basketball game, at first said to be an AIDS fundraiser, hosted and promoted by Sean Puffy Combs. He held the event along with another well-known rapper, Heavy D. Combs was no stranger to throwing big parties and even bigger after parties. It was something he did often. In 1993, Combs was fired from Uptown, but started his own label, Bad Boy Records. He signed the then unknown rapper Christopher Wallace, the notorious B.I.G., who would soon become one of the most iconic figures in hip hop history. And Combs garnered significantly more fame as a result. He soon adopted the first iteration of his stage name Puff Daddy, and in 1996, began recording for his own rap debut. His first single, Can't Nobody Hold Me Down, came in January 1997. But then in March, Biggie Smalls was infamously shot and killed. Combs released his second single, I'll Be Missing You, with Faith Evans in May, and his debut album, No Way Out, in July. Biggie's murder undoubtedly shook the hip-hop community. It also impacted Combs's career, leading him to mainstream success. He won the first of his three Grammys in 1998, with the other coming six years later in 2004. It was also around this time, however, that the first widely reported controversies and legal issues involving Combs came to light. In 1999, he was charged with assault against Steve Stout, a record executive who he attacked with a champagne bottle. It was reportedly in response to a crucifixion scene that Combs didn't approve of in the music video for a song he worked on with Nas. At the time, as part of his punishment, he was ordered to attend an anger management class. Later that year, in December 1999, Combs made headlines following gunshots at a club. He, Jennifer Lopez, and a then-up-and-coming Belizean rapper Shine are said to have been involved in an argument with others at the venue when weapons were fired. Combs was arrested and charged with weapons offenses, as well as with trying to bribe his driver to take the heat. He was eventually found not guilty, while Shine was sentenced to 10 years in prison. Today, years after serving his time, Shine is a prominent politician in Belize. Combs moved into the 21st century with another name change in 2001, from Puff Daddy to P. Diddy. And he became more than just a music mogul. His fashion brand, Sean John, picked up a slew of awards in the early 2000s, despite various controversies, including reports of unfair and illegal working conditions for employees, as well as the discovery that some Sean John clothing was made using genuine raccoon dog fur. 
He started acting too, including with roles in Monsters Ball in 2001, Get Him to the Greek in 2010, and Girls Trip in 2017. Make some noise! From 2007 to 2023, Combs was the face of the French vodka brand Ciroc. In 2013, he co-founded the TV network Revolt. In 2015, he partnered with the actor Mark Wahlberg to buy a majority stake in a sports drinks company. Notably, after three solo records in four years at the turn of the century, his only other solo studio album throughout this time came in 2006 with Press Play, which includes a long list of high-profile featured artists, including Nicole Scherzinger, Christina Aguilera, CeeLo Green, and Jamie Foxx. Would you like me to press play? Please. Holmes's business empire grew and grew, but in the background, his reputation was being shaped by other events. In 2001, the TV host Roger Mills sued Combs, alleging that he, Mills, had been assaulted by Combs' entourage on Combs' orders after an interview question about the death of Biggie Smalls. In 2003, Combs' former partner Kirk Burroughs also sued him, alleging that he had threatened violence if Burroughs didn't sign over shares in Bad Boy Records. I guess this means more money, more problems for you. Yeah, I guess so. More money, more problems. In 2008, Combs settled out of court following yet more allegations that he had punched a man, pushed a woman, and spat on another woman shortly following an Oscars after-party in L.A. in 2007. Among the growing number of unsavory stories, Combs facilitated another name change in 2005, this time from P. Diddy to Diddy. But that also brought some controversy when it was legally ruled that he couldn't use his new moniker in the UK due to it already belonging to an English DJ. What is your name? <laughs> <laughs> no, I, no, I feel it's very important that I clear that up. I decided that I'm just going to go with the name Diddy. In 2015, Combs was arrested after fighting his son's football coach and allegedly threatening him with a kettlebell, although the charges were ultimately dropped. In 2017, Combs' former personal chef Cindy Ruetta sued him over the long hours and unfair conditions that she was made to work in. Ruetta's lawsuit also alleged continued sexual harassment carried out by Combs and his manager at the time. In 2019, Combs' former girlfriend, Gina Huynh, alleged via YouTube that he had before tried to pay her to have an abortion and that he had in the past hit her and stomped on her stomach. Despite all of the above, it appeared in 2023 that Combs was making a return to music, with the release of his fifth studio album, The Love Album, Off the Grid. It again included a lot of well-known featured artists, such as John Legend, Justin Bieber, and The Weeknd, but it didn't achieve comparable critical or commercial success. Well, I never get another me. I ain't this sh God ain't impressed. Combs was named that year's global icon at the 2023 MTV Video Music Awards, though just weeks afterwards and the lawsuits that have now come to define his legacy started to come in. In November 2023, Cassie Ventura, better known as Cassie, filed a lawsuit against Combs with a long list of allegations. She had been in a long-term relationship with Combs from around 2007 to 2018. In the lawsuit, she accused him of continued serious sexual assault, sex trafficking, physical abuse, and of forcing her to be intimate with male sex workers. Cassie further accused Combs of weapons-related crimes, uncontrollable rage, and of blowing up the rapper Kid Cudi's car in 2012 at a time when she was dating him. Later, in the same week of November 2023, two further claimants came forward against Combs, also alleging that he had sexually assaulted them and had subjected them to and blackmailed them with revenge porn. In December 2023, a fourth lawsuit was filed in New York, again for sexual offenses. This indictment reads it's very disturbing. The facts presented are um, out of, you know, a very bad Hollywood story. And a lot of the evidence, alleged evidence, that's been gathered in this case was from those two raids that were conducted on his personal homes. In February 2024, the producer Rodney Jones filed against Combs, claiming that he had been forced by Combs to arrange and engage with sex workers while he watched. In March 2024, multiple properties owned by Combs were raided by the police and authorities, with various items, including computers, reportedly seized. In April 2024, Combs's son Christian was named alongside his father in another lawsuit citing sexual assault, as well as claims that Combs had tried to cover it up by offering to pay the victim. 
In May 2024, CCTV footage was released by CNN, clearly showing Combs kicking and beating Cassie in a hotel corridor and lobby. In the following weeks and months, the claims against Combs continued to mount until in New York on September 16, 2024, he was arrested and charged. The next day, Combs pled not guilty to all charges against him. According to reports, he attempted to negotiate a $50 million bail, but it was denied. The judge was said to be concerned that Combs, if he were granted bail, would seek to threaten and intimidate witnesses. The sex trafficking case against Sean Diddy Combs moving full speed ahead. Lawyers for Combs and prosecutors set to hold a status conference to determine the next phase following the sweeping indictment alleging the music mogul leveraged his business empire, power, and prestige to abuse his alleged victims. Combs has long been linked to controversy but the true scale of his alleged crimes is only now coming to light. His timeline has taken him from those early days as hip hop's next big thing to the emerging truth that his story and lifestyle appear really to be one of the darkest and most disturbing in music history. This is quite the downfall to go from, I mean, we saw the mansions back, back in March that were raided by the feds. So to go from living in those mansions to being in a jail cell right now, I think it really underscores the magnitude of what he's facing and the weight of the federal government. It's now time to take a look at Diddy moments that, thanks to a new perspective, have become disturbing. What's one misconception about you? There are no misconceptions about me. Welcome to Watch Mojo, and today we're looking at moments involving Sean P. Diddy Combs that feel disturbing in the wake of his 2024 arrest and indictment, among other things. You know, so you have, if you don't have what they need, they're gonna leave. Right. Gotta right. keep them there. Right. You need, you need locks on the doors. <laughs> Okay, this is sounding kind of dangerous now. Diddy Parties. Over the years, numerous celebrities have praised Diddy Parties, from LeBron James to Ben Stiller in the Bad Boys for Life music video. Listen, uh, if you have one of your crazy uh, house party things, shout me a holla dunk. In a 2005 VMAs ad, Derek Jeter, Nicole Richie, the Ying Yang Twins, and Fat Joe reflected on their experiences at Diddy Parties, portraying them as can't-miss events. Given the recent descriptions of Combs's alleged freak-off parties, these celebrity testimonies come across as insensitive in retrospect. It's hard to say which is more off the hook, a Diddy party or a Diddy after party, or a Diddy after after party, which is basically a pre-party for the next Diddy party. Combs's accounts of his parties have not aged well either. In a resurfaced video, Combs films a seemingly passed out DJ named James as another guest places a drink on his head. Whether joking or not, Combs' claim that he puts white guys to sleep at his parties has taken on a more alarming meaning. For all those in London that don't know what happens to the white man when he comes to a P. Diddy party, this is what happens to the white man. Okay, what happens? Uh, it's so unfortunate. Usher sees, quote, very curious things. Usher lived with Combs for about a year during his early teens. And I lived with Sean Puffy Combs for a year. That's the crazy thing. Now, that yeah. was L.A. Reid's idea, right? In a 2016 appearance on The Howard Stern Show, Usher recounted his time in New York with Combs. Usher recalled several names like Biggie Smalls and Lil' Kim dropping by as parties raged into the early morning. I went there to see the lifestyle. Right. And, and I saw it. And it was, <laughs> and it was, but I don't know if I could indulge and understand what I was even looking at. It was, it was pretty wild. While Usher claims he stayed up later than Combs and his crew, he wasn't sure if he could, quote, indulge in some of the activities taking place. Although Usher didn't entirely understand everything going on, Combs's lifestyle was clearly, quote, wild, quote, crazy, and, quote, curious. When asked if he would ever send his kids to, quote, Puffy Camp, Usher gave a firm no. You're a dad now. Would you ever send your kid to Puffy Camp? <laughs> you Hell know? no. Usher said this with a laugh, but the allegations that have come out since have piqued our curiosity. Get him to the Greek. As funny as this 2010 comedy was upon release, it's hard to rewatch without thinking about how problematic several cast members have become. It's better. It's better that you've apologized, because now we can start to rebuild. In 2023, two women, one being his ex-girlfriend, accused Jonah Hill of abusive behavior. The same year, Russell Brand's history of sexual assault accusations caught up to him. Then there's Combs, who played hot-headed record producer Sergio Roma. Oh, y'all think this meeting is for me? No, no, this meeting is not for me, it's for y'all. See, see, I'm gonna be all right. I'm straight. 
I got villas in Brazil, Tahiti, East Hampton, West Hampton. Sergio gonna be fine. While the character was likely intended as a self-aware send-up of Combs's bombastic persona, it might have hit closer to home than the filmmakers realized. In one notable scene, a whacked-out Sergio goes on a rampage, chasing Hill and Brand's characters down a hallway. Where you going? Run all the way back to LA! Nowadays, when we think of Combs running down a hallway, an infamous video involving Cassie Ventura immediately comes to mind. Quote, I'm a savage. Combs's YouTube channel posted multiple videos building hype for the 2017 documentary Can't Stop, Won't Stop. We want to hit him with that pure, uncut, 1,000% who we are. If you think that title has taken on an uncomfortable sentiment, the same can be said about the aforementioned videos. In one, Combs talks about how important winning is to him, which has likely never been more true than now. I want to win over and over and over. In another clip, Combs sits in his office, making a deal with MTV over the phone. Combs is so excited about the outcome that he starts messing up his desk, proclaiming that he's a, quote, savage who gets whatever he wants and can't be kept down. Savage! I'm a savage! Oh! Taking a breather, Combs proceeds to ask what's next, although we're not sure he wants the answer. Jennifer Lopez's mom. After appearing in the Been Around the World music video, Jennifer Lopez dated Combs from 1999 to 2001. So handsome. In a later interview with Wendy Williams, the talk show host floated the idea of Lopez and Combs getting back together. Before Lopez could answer, she pointed to her mother, Guadalupe Rodriguez, in the audience. The horrified expression on Rodriguez's face said everything, as did a dismissive hand motion. Look at him. Look it. Lopez went on to talk about how Combs sent her 100 white doves, which wasn't as romantic as he might have envisioned. Even if this gesture had won Lopez back, it's safe to say her mother would not have approved. It's crazy everybody has, like, everybody came alive. Everybody they all has, had something to say. Yeah, everybody has an opinion. Yes! It's funny to me. So, but, all right, so no puffy. Be this due to Combs's suspected infidelity during his relationship with Lopez or another reason, Rodriguez has strong parental instincts. Ashton Kutcher's Hot Ones interview. Although he has somewhat distanced himself from Combs as of late, Ashton Kutcher was once proud to call the rapper his friend. Diddy party stories, they're our favorite genre of anecdote. If oh, you really? have one, yeah. Wow, okay, I've got a lot I can't tell. During his 2019 interview on Hot Ones, Kutcher was asked if he had any Diddy party stories to share. Kutcher had plenty, but he struggled to think of one that he could tell. Can't tell that one either. <laughs> I mean, I'm like actually cycling through them. With a smile, the actor shifted the subject away from the parties, instead talking about how he first met Combs and a memorable run the two shared. While Kutcher avoided discussing any parties, there has been speculation that he could be called to testify at Combs' trial, which would put him in a much hotter seat. In any case, Kutcher's comment that Combs, quote, can't lose, plays differently now. Well, he just can't lose. Even when he's that close to humility, that, like, it becomes a driver, and so then he went out and ran the New York Marathon. The world is filled with uncomfortable lyrics. Combing through Diddy's discography, some of his music sounds almost prognostic. Yo, the sun don't shine forever, but as long as it's here, then we might as well shine together. This includes the music video for 1998's Victory, in which the artist runs away from the authorities. Of all the songs he collaborated on, 1997's The World Is Filled may be the most unnerving to revisit. Throughout his verse, Combs sings about how it's a, quote, privilege for women to be with him, although the lyrics paint a much more troubling portrait. Won't you admit it? I ain't gotta talk it cause I live it. Any chick with me, believe me, that's a privilege. The line, quote, never give up freedom feels especially ironic and creepy. This isn't just because Combs has been arrested, but considering that the charges against him include sex trafficking, there's more than one way to interpret the word freedom here. We date him like we hate him, see him like we don't need him, treat him like we meet him, and never give him freedom. Donald Trump's, quote, good friend. The year was 2012. Combs was making a cameo on It's Always Sunny in Philadelphia, while a future commander-in-chief was endorsing the rapper on Celebrity Apprentice 5. Working 20? for Diddy. Absolutely. I love Diddy. When Aubrey O'Day brought up Combs, Donald Trump was quick to champion him. As Trump called Combs a, quote, good friend, O'Day wasn't willing to comment on whether she thought he was a, quote, good guy. Is he a good guy? I don't want to answer that oh, question. Oh, well, I, I think he's a good guy. I'm going to stick up for him. Our perceptions of Trump and Combs have drastically changed since this episode aired. 
Combs has reciprocated Trump's friendship in the past, although in an interview with Jimmy Kimmel, the singer said he wouldn't want to run for president like him. I don't, I, don't, I don't know if I could be responsible for the whole country. Kimmel thought Combs would be a better leader than Trump, but the host might, just might be reconsidering that statement. His All That Appearance the docu-series Quiet on Set shined a spotlight on the dark side of several Nickelodeon shows, such as All That. I was so excited, but I had no idea what kind of wild ride I was getting into. In 2002, Combs appeared in the sketch comedy's now infamous Lil Fetus episode. Combs' presence has only added to the notoriety. The episode contains a few moments that aged like milk, including young girls cheering for Combs and the singer's giant head looking through a young boy's window. Good morning. <laughs> can see you in your room. <laughs> hey, 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 stop screaming. <laughs> hey, it's just me, P. Diddy. In the cringiest scene, Jack DeSena and Brian Hearn try to wake up Shane Lyons. They turn to Diddy, who gives them a toy helicopter and tells him to shove it down Shane's pants. When that doesn't work, Combs hands them the remote control, and the boys turn the helicopter on, awakening Shane to a world of pain. Shall I? By all means. <laughs> you know, for kids. Justin Bieber's 48 Hours with Diddy. In 2009, a video was posted to Justin Bieber's YouTube page featuring the teenage singer and Diddy. As soon as you turn 16, Addressing the camera, Combs said Bieber would be hanging out with him for 48 hours. Combs wouldn't divulge exactly what they would be up to, but he presented it as a dream come true for a boy of Bieber's age. It seemed innocent, even cool at the time. I don't really, I don't have legal guardianship of him, but for the next 48 hours, he's with me. So, um, and, yeah, and we're gonna go full, buck full crazy. Fifteen years later, though, we can't help but read more into the awkward word choice. For the record, Combs says, quote, buck full crazy, but it sounds like something else. The two reunited in another video where Combs mentions they haven't seen each other in a while. This prompts Bieber to give him a fake number. Okay. okay. Number? Yeah, yeah, I'm, I'm yeah, yeah. I'm going to tell you my number. Yeah, 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 yeah. It's 555. Five, five. Yes. Okay. 555. Five, five, five. Okay. 555. Five. Okay. You heard that? What Diddy moments do you look at differently? Your parents ain't let you watch the Cosby show when you was coming up? Oh, my parents would never have let me watch something like that. It's now time to delve into the incredible true story of Diddy and Tupac, a tale of one of the most infamous feuds in music history. Dwayne Davis, also known as Keefe D, says that rapper Sean Diddy Combs was also involved in that murder of Tupac Shakur. Welcome to Watch Mojo, and today we're exploring the history between Sean Diddy Combs and Tupac Amaru Shakur. You know what I mean? It's between me and him, and only he knows. Part 1. A Tale of Two Coasts Before Diddy and Tupac were household names, there was already a long-standing feud between the East Coast and West Coast hip-hop scenes. What? Wait, wait, wait. The East Coast don't love Dr. Dre and Snoop Dogg and Death Row? Hip-hop can be traced back to the early 70s when it emerged from block parties in the Bronx. With the music genre rooted in New York, the East Coast scene prided itself on being the top dog. Cause I don't like to dream about getting paid, so I dig into the books of the rhymes that I made. As the 80s transitioned to the 90s, though, the West Coast started to find its voice, becoming a formidable contender to the East Coast's crown. Well, if it's good enough to get from a proper chunk, I take a small piece of some of this funky stuff. Despite this growing rivalry, some called for unity. Near the turn of the decade, songs like Stop the Violence came from the East Coast, while the West Coast echoed with We're All in the Same Gang. I'm not trying to tell you what to do. You have your own freedom of choice who to listen to. Tensions began to escalate in 1991 when Suge Knight, Dr. Dre, Dick Griffey, and D.O.C. founded the West Coast label Death Row Records. You can work all your life and get a little bit of money, or you can be a businessman, an entrepreneur, and be your own boss. With hit albums like The Chronic and Doggy Style, the West Coast was gaining the respect it had sought for so long. As the West Coast reached a turning point, so did the East Coast, as Sean Puffy Combs founded Bad Boy Records. I didn't want to just make records. I didn't want to just make money. I wanted to make history. Having recently been fired from Uptown Records, the artist who would soon be known as Diddy established himself as a music mogul, bringing on talent like Christopher Biggie Smalls Wallace, aka the Notorious B.I.G. Your hands in the air if you're the 
true player. Despite being born in New York, Biggie spent some time in Los Angeles, where he befriended another rising rapper named Tupac Shakur. Introduced through a drug dealer, Biggie would crash on Shakur's couch in California. Shakur also visited Biggie in New York. Um, they just had a lot of fun around each other. At one point, Biggie asked Shakur to be his manager. Shakur suggested he stick with Diddy, saying, quote, he will make you a star. Regardless, their friendship wouldn't survive the East-West rivalry. While in New York on November 30th, 1994, Shakur dropped by Quad Studios with an entourage, including rapper Randy Stretch Walker. Confronted by three men in the lobby, Shakur was shot multiple times. He come out, look around, stick up the middle finger. Put him in the ambulance. Although it seemed like a robbery, Shakur grew suspicious when Diddy and Biggie arrived on the scene with James Jimmy Henchman Rosemond, the latter of whom had called him to quad. Shakur became convinced that Bad Boy had set him up. I used to share my experiences in the game and my lessons and my rules and my knowledge on the game with him. You know what I mean? He owed me more. Following the shooting, Shakur was sent to prison for sexual abuse in early 1995. Diddy visited Shakur during his incarceration, claiming Bad Boy wasn't behind the shooting. This did little to ease Shakur's suspicions. The beef reached a boiling point in August 1995. After seeing Shakur in prison, Suge Knight headed to the Source Awards. First of all, I'd like to thank God. Second of all, I'd like to thank my whole entire Death Row family. Accepting Motion Picture Soundtrack of the Year, Knight threw shade at Diddy, who seemingly took the high road in another speech. I'd like to tell Tupac, keep his guards up. We ride with him. <laughs> Only a month after Knight received booze at the Source Awards, his friend Jai Big Jake Robles was murdered while leaving a birthday party. Knight blamed Diddy, who was also in attendance. After Knight secured his release from Rikers Island, Shakur officially joined the Death Row family. It's West Side. Part 2 – Changes Whether or not Bad Boy was behind Shakur's shooting, he was now the enemy. Shakur fired lyrical shots at Diddy, Biggie, and Bad Boy with his diss track Hit Em Up. Some theorized that Biggie referenced Shakur in the song Long Kiss Goodnight. Maniac put my name in rap. While war had been declared, Shakur didn't come off as phased. Having survived multiple shootings and incarcerations, a part of Tupac seemed to think he was invincible. Shakur's luck ran out in Las Vegas on September 7, 1996. After getting into a fight with gang member Orlando Baby Lane Anderson at the MGM Grand, Shakur headed to a nightclub with Suge Knight. At a stoplight, a Cadillac pulled up to their vehicle. Shots were fired, with Shakur getting hit four times. But police still have no leads on a suspect or motive. Six days later, Shakur died in the hospital. In February 1997, Diddy and Snoop Dogg, himself a West Coast artist, appeared on The Steve Harvey Show together. There ain't no East Coast, West Coast beef. I swear. Yep. We ain't coming to talk about nothing behind us. We come to talk about what's ahead of us. Both also held a press conference pleading to end the rivalry between the East and West Coasts. Snoop said, quote, I don't want to talk about yesterday. I want to talk about tomorrow. We've got to come together, shake hands, call for peace, and move forward. We're here to make a difference, you know what I'm saying? So we want y'all to stay in school and keep y'all heads in y'all books. The violence didn't stop, however. On March 9th, that same year, Biggie was fatally gunned down in Los Angeles. Los Angeles police are investigating the shooting death of rapper Notorious B.I.G., also known as Biggie Small. With many believing Bad Boy assassinated Shakur, Biggie's shooting was seen as retaliation. Tupac and Biggie's deaths were the climax of the East-West rivalry, with more artists calling for peace over the following years. Part 3. Who Shot Ya? Animosity between the East and West Coasts has died down since the 90s. With Tupac and Biggie's murders going unsolved for years, though, a shadow of doubt continued to loom over both coasts. We know who's responsible for this. The problem we have with this case is we don't have anyone willing to come forward and testify to it. In a 2002 Los Angeles Times article entitled Who Killed Tupac Shakur, investigative reporter Chuck Phillips suggested the shooter was Orlando Anderson, who died in 1998. Phillips also implied that Biggie put a $1 million hit on Shakur, supplying the murder weapon. While Anderson and Biggie had denied involvement, the article renewed interest in the case. The LA Times retracted the article in 2008 after Diddy accused the outlet of falsely connecting him to Shakur's death. Diddy stated, quote, It is beyond ridiculous and completely false, calling the Times, quote, irresponsible. We don't even entertain nonsense, my brother. 
So we're not even going to even go there with all due respect. Phillips nonetheless stood by his statements until his death in January 2024. A year before Phillips' passing, the authorities seemingly reached a breakthrough in Shakur's murder. It has often been said, justice delayed is justice denied. It's a quote we hear often and for many, many years. On September 29, 2023, the Las Vegas police arrested Dwayne Keefe D. Davis, Anderson's uncle. A grand jury indicted Dwayne Davis on one count of murder with a deadly weapon. It wasn't the first time Davis's name had come up in Shakur's case. In 2011, LAPD detective Greg Kading, who had investigated Biggie's murder, published a book alleging that Diddy offered Davis a cool million to take out Shakur and Suge Knight. Murders are related in the sense that they both were a result of the conflict that was going on between the two different record labels. While Davis had been on the authorities' radar, the gang leader managed to avoid incarceration until he started openly talking about Shakur's death. This included a 2019 tell-all memoir, which paved the way to his eventual arrest. Davis's trial is set to commence in March 2025. Despite Davis's past claims that Diddy was involved, the Las Vegas police have never considered him a suspect. I just don't see any proof of it. I don't see I don't see it leading anywhere other than the real story, which is that the, you know, the murder took place with Orlando Anderson. Despite Davis's past claims that Diddy was involved, the Las Vegas police have never considered him a suspect. Many doubt Diddy's connection given the lack of evidence. Davis isn't the most reliable or consistent witness either. Likewise, it's difficult to back up the theories that Suge Knight ordered Biggie's assassination. In any case, Diddy and Knight haven't wiped their hands of any legal trouble. Following a hit and run in 2015, Knight was sentenced to 28 years in prison. Developing news now, former rap mogul Suge Knight is headed to prison for voluntary manslaughter. Parole won't be on the table until October 2034. Meanwhile, Diddy was arrested in September 2024 amid widespread accusations of abuse and sex trafficking. Over 100 have taken legal action against Diddy. A year ago, Sean Combs stood in Times Square and was handed a key to New York City. Today, he's been indicted and will face justice in the Southern District of New York. While Diddy is facing charges for his alleged history of sexual misconduct, that doesn't mean people have forgotten about the Tupac conspiracy theories. Fellow rappers like Eminem, J.I.D., and 50 Cent continue to point fingers at Diddy. But I ain't trying to beef with him because he might put a hit on me like KVD. Get him. Crime scene investigator Cheryl McCollum, who worked on Shakur's case, also believed Diddy played a role. Somebody close to him knows his whereabouts on that day, that time, and that location. Tupac's family has pushed to reopen the case, although his stepbrother Moprim Shakur says, It's not about that guy specifically. It's about justice for my brother. That said, Mo Prem doubted Diddy was, quote, 100% honest when he denied involvement. Whatever future investigations uncover, Diddy survived longer than Tupac or Biggie. In this business, though, sometimes you either die a legend or live long enough to see yourself become the villain. What's one misconception about you? There are no misconceptions about me. What are your thoughts on Diddy and Tupac's history? We wouldn't even get into nonsense like that. You know what I'm saying? A lot of people have been questioning the link between Diddy and Justin Bieber. Just how did this surprising industry relationship come to be? Take a look. So I'm going to be driving this yeah, next yeah. year. Yeah, when you get 16. Welcome to Watch Mojo. And today we're exploring the history between Sean Diddy Combs and Justin Bieber. I just think there's so many issues in society and things that I'm eventually going to want to just speak about. Part 1. The Lost 48 Hours Diddy, or Puff Daddy, was already an established performer and music mogul by the time Justin Bieber was born on March 1, 1994. That same year, Diddy welcomed another young protege to Puffy Flavor Camp. Usher was a young teenager when he went to live with Diddy in New York for a year. And you're going to go to Puff Daddy's. He's going to In the 90s, do you understand what that's like? Diddy executive produced Usher's debut studio album and introduced the rising star to his excessive lifestyle. Reflecting on Diddy's, quote, wild parties in 2016, Usher said he'd never send his children to Flavor Camp. You're a dad now. Would you ever send your kid to Puffy Camp? <laughs> Hell no. <laughs> that didn't stop one of Usher's protégés from working and partying alongside Puffy. After Scooter Braun discovered Justin Bieber on YouTube, the 13-year-old singer met Usher. Braun and Usher founded RBMG Records, delivering a launching pad for Bieber's career. Yeah, and we ended up signing a deal with, with Usher a couple months later. Although Usher provided a common link, 
Bieber directly contacted Diddy through Twitter on October 15, 2009, asking if he'd collaborate on a song. Diddy quickly responded, quote, send me the song, I'll check it out, thanks. Bieber soon found himself at Diddy's house with a few others. Although they didn't record a song, the two shot a video where Diddy promised Bieber a Lamborghini for his upcoming 16th birthday and a mansion for his 18th. When you get 18, you get the house. Get the mansion. Okay. Addressing the camera, Diddy said Bieber would be with him for 48 hours. This video saw a resurgence in 2024 as Diddy faced charges of abuse and sex trafficking. These accusations left people viewing the video in a much different light, prompting them to question what happened over those 48 hours. Where we hanging out and what we doing, um, we, we can't really disclose. While there isn't a detailed record, the fan wiki Bieberpedia has potentially connected a few dots. The video was posted to Bieber's YouTube channel on November 9th, 2009. Where would you like to go? Um, I mean, wherever you want to go. According to Bieberpedia, though, the video was shot on October 31st. That same day, Bieber recorded a bit for 97.1 AMP radio and modeled for the clothing company Levi's. By nightfall, Bieber was trick-or-treating with his friends. Diddy notably isn't present in any of these photos. On November 1st, Bieber tweeted that he couldn't travel to Vancouver for a show as planned because of an illness. If Bieberpedia is accurate, it's possible that Diddy wasn't actually with Bieber for 48 straight hours and that video was more of a publicity stunt. Man after my heart, that's what I'm talking about, yeah. Another video posted to Diddy's YouTube page on December 15, 2010, also garnered concern amid his recent arrest. When Diddy asked why they hadn't hung out for a while, Bieber gave him a fake 555 number. Yeah. It's 555? Yes. Okay. 5555. Okay. 555. Five. Right. You heard that? Knowing what we know now, some have interpreted this as Bieber trying to distance himself from Diddy. This seems unlikely for three reasons. One, if that was the case, Bieber probably wouldn't have shot the video or accepted Diddy's dirty money swag. There you go. That is Justin that Bieber. Is swag. Is it your swag? Two, Bieber obviously wasn't going to give his real number in a public video. And three, Diddy and Bieber were seen together several times throughout the following years. Most notably, Jimmy Kimmel interviewed them in 2011, where Diddy said Bieber, quote, knows better than to share what they do together. He knows better than to be talking about the things that he does with Big Brother Puff. Part two, stuck with you. Bieber started to gain a bad boy reputation after being arrested in January 2014. Pulled over for suspicions of drunk driving, Bieber was also accused of drag race, driving with an expired license and resisting arrest. All right, the first case uh, this afternoon is uh, Justin Bieber. Diddy defended Bieber, saying he would ensure the young artist made more responsible decisions. I don't think that he um, should, should be judged like he's not a human being. Or he's this wasn't reflected behind the scenes. A month after his arrest, Bieber was seen at one of Diddy's parties in Atlanta. Rick Ross, Little Scrappy, T.I., and several others were also in attendance. Bieber was still a month away from turning 20. Although the media focused on Bieber's behavior, few questioned the nature of Diddy's parties or why so many adults were partying with someone who hadn't even turned 21 yet. Bieber attended Justin Combs's 21st birthday in 2015. Then, when Bieber turned 21, he recorded a video with Diddy. Drinking tequila together, Diddy claimed that this was Bieber's, quote, first shot ever. Justin Bieber's first shot ever. Do not believe it. For Bieber's 22nd birthday, Diddy presented him with a bad boy Letterman jacket. By early 2020, it appeared Bieber had changed his ways, expressing a desire to start a family with his wife Haley. In an Apple Music interview, Bieber also tearfully made a vague statement about wanting to, quote, protect Billie Eilish from the industry hurdles he endured as an up-and-coming artist. I just want to protect her, you know? I don't want her to go through anything I went through. Bieber didn't name any names and could have been alluding to any number of struggles. Through a modern lens, though, it's hard not to think of Diddy. It was hard for me being that young and being in the industry. And that. A few months after the Apple interview, two Twitter users accused Bieber of sexual assault. Bieber denied these accusations and filed a defamation suit against the users, which he later dropped. Bieber weathered this scandal, with the media's attention soon shifting to Diddy. In 2021, Diddy was recorded checking to see if Bieber was wearing a wire, albeit playfully. In 2023, Bieber was featured in the song Moments for Diddy's fifth studio album, The Love Album, Off the Grid. 
Over a decade after Bieber reached out to Diddy on Twitter, the two had finally collaborated on a song. I've been faking for a long time. The Love Album was possibly the last high point of Diddy's career. It also might have marked the end of his friendship with Bieber. Part 3. Monster In November 2023, Diddy's ex Cassie Ventura filed a lawsuit against him, alleging assault and sex trafficking. Despite settling, Diddy lost in the court of public opinion after footage of him seemingly beating Ventura was leaked. More lawsuits piled up before Diddy's arrest in September 2024. Lawyer said in a statement that he voluntarily actually relocated to New York recently um, in anticipation of these charges. After Diddy's indictment, over 100 others, some minors, would join in legal action against him. While Diddy has denied these claims and is innocent until proven guilty, the public may never view him the same way again. As such, the photos of him hanging out with Bieber have taken on a more disturbing sentiment. Given Bieber's age at the time and the crimes that allegedly took place at Diddy's parties, some have questioned if the young artist was groomed. I don't really, I don't have legal guardianship of him, but for the next 48 hours, he's with me. Around the same time as Diddy's arrest, Bieber seemingly released a song about losing himself at a Diddy party. The song includes unsettling lyrics like, quote, I was in it for a new Ferrari, but it cost me way more than my soul. According to researchers, though, this viral song is almost certainly AI generated. There's still some AI artifacts in the voice that I can, that I can hear. As of writing, the real Bieber has remained mostly silent about his former mentor. About a month before Diddy's arrest, Justin and Hailey Bieber welcomed their first child. As Diddy dominated headlines, a source said that Bieber just wanted, quote, to focus on being a great dad and husband. A source also claimed that Bieber was, quote, advised to stay as far away as possible from anything and everything related to Diddy. They've been absorbed in their own happiness and family, appreciating this time together. Supposedly, Bieber is, quote, completely disgusted by the accusations against Diddy and wants, quote, nothing to do with him. While Bieber is reportedly having a hard time processing his history with the fallen music mogul, quote, his happiness being a dad has outweighed his anxiety about Diddy. Much remains unclear about Bieber's time with Diddy, and many of these questions may ultimately go unanswered. Online sleuths will surely continue to read between the lines, but for now, speculation is all we have to go on. To a lot of us, he's like a, a, a little brother. It seems two things are for certain, however. Diddy was once somebody that Bieber looked up to, now, not so much. What once seemed like a 15-year-old's dream has become a nightmare for everyone involved. It's definitely a 15-year-old's dream. What's your take on Diddy and Bieber? Starting to act different, huh? You, you, ain't, you ain't been calling me and hanging out. We now turn to our sister channel, Miss Mojo, for the wild ride that was the explosive romance between Diddy and J-Lo. At first, I, I didn't like him at all. You know, I didn't. I thought he was like, you know, it. Welcome to Watch Mojo, and today we're taking you back to when Diddy met J Lo and the roller coaster of a relationship that ensued. Tough time, and you know, what can you do? Just gotta go through it. Part one If You Had My Love. The year was 1999. Sean Diddy Combs was still going by Puff Daddy with his second studio album Forever on the horizon. Jennifer Lopez, meanwhile, was better known as a dancer and actress. Two years earlier, Lopez appeared in Diddy's Been Around the World music video and starred in the biopic Selena. This turned out good. Susie did a good job. Yeah, I dig it. I like it if you like it. I like it, it looks good. Her portrayal of Selena Quintanilla Perez marked a stepping stone to music, followed by the release of her debut album, On the Six. In addition to serving as one of the album's producers, Diddy was featured on the track Feelin' So Good. He was also heavily involved in the music video for Lopez's lead single, If You Had My Love, suggesting a website theme as the dot-com bubble neared its peak. Rumors started circulating that Diddy was dating Lopez, whose marriage to Ohani Noah had recently ended. Because they're always trying to make something of you and Puffy. Yeah, me and Puffy, me and Maxwell, me, tons of people, me and Mark Anthony, who I do, did a duet with. Although Lopez initially told talk show hosts like David Letterman that Diddy was just a friend, their relationship became official following the MTV Video Music Awards in September 1999. 
With Diddy becoming a music mogul and Lopez being a rising superstar, the courtship was bound to attract media attention. Things started to happen. I started looking into her eyes, more spending more time with her, and I just fell in love with her. Less than a year into the relationship, Diddy and Lopez were in the spotlight for more notorious reasons. Part two, I'll be missing you. On December 27th, 1999, Diddy and Lopez were at a Times Square nightclub with Bad Boy Records artist Shine. At the club, they partied with a large entourage, including Bad Boy rapper Jamal Shine Barrow. And they were in the VIP section. People were looking at them, the puppy was dancing, he had two bubbles in his hand. Diddy and Shine reportedly entered a confrontation with felon Matthew Scar Allen, all three drawing firearms. Gunshots were heard, with three bystanders being injured. Diddy, Shine, and Lopez were arrested, although the latter was quickly released without facing any charges. They say that we were evading police and I had a gun. Puffy was booked and held on gun possession charges, igniting a media frenzy. Diddy and Shine were both indicted, however. Despite the negative press, Lopez and Diddy managed to overshadow the shooting headlines with an iconic red carpet moment. The following February, the couple attended the 42nd Annual Grammy Awards. Diddy draped himself in a gray and white suit, but all eyes were on Lopez's green Versace dress. When Puffy showed up at the 2000 Grammys with Jennifer Lopez on his arm in a Versace dress that defied the laws of physics, he was the envy of men everywhere. Defined by its tropical pattern and deep neckline, the dress became instantly recognizable and a symbol of Lopez's coronation into the A-list. I said, I got nominated for a Grammy! What are you talking about? I said, oh, they just want me to come again to see what I'm gonna wear. Up until this point, some might have argued that Lopez was riding on the coattails of Diddy's success. Seeing Lopez slay the red carpet, though, she was the one making him look good. Has the trouble uh, <laughs> affected the uh, relationship? No. Okay. Whether intentional or not, their Grammy's appearance sent a message. The gun trial isn't going to hold us down. That said, the charges were not going away. Diddy recalled being scared leading up to the trial's verdict in March 2001. It was a scary situation because you have, you know, 12 people who uh, um, hold the fate of your life. Um, but, you know, I put it in God's hands. And you know, he brought me out of it, and I give all glory to God, and I'm forever grateful. While Diddy was acquitted, Shine got the short end of the stick, serving almost a decade in prison. Since being released in 2009, Shine has returned to his birthplace of Belize, where he's become a political leader. Let us not lose sight of what the cold hard facts are. This was not someone uh, who I vacationed with and who he and I enjoyed this great, intimate relationship of brotherhood, this is someone who destroyed my life. The gun trial essentially ended his friendship with Diddy, who was also down one girlfriend. A month before Diddy was cleared of all charges, his two-year relationship with Lopez ended. We'd be surprised if the shooting and trial didn't put a strain on the relationship. I, at that time, was, uh, cared very deeply uh, for, for Sean, and, um, you know, we just, we just didn't, have the same kind of ideals about life and family and stuff like that and just wasn't a good relationship for me. According to Lopez though, infidelity was at the root of their breakup, saying it was quote, the first time she was with someone who wasn't faithful. While Lopez didn't catch him cheating, she could sense what Diddy was up to every night he didn't return home. He felt like he loved me very much and I know he did and I, I felt like the same way. So if I was unhappy in some way, then I was the one who had to do something. Not him, he was doing everything he wanted to do. Lopez remembered crying and feeling she was, quote, going nuts, conceding that Diddy would never fully commit. Diddy wasn't quite ready to give up on Lopez, sending her 100 white doves and 100 pink balloons. And they released, like, hundreds of doves, white doves. Oh my God, I can't breathe. Right, and I was like, oh, oh my God. <laughs> Did it work? Did you go back with him? No, it didn't work. All right. He also asked singer Luther Vandross to serenade her and had employees, quote, camp outside MTV's TRL studios with signs to win Lopez back. Lopez wasn't swayed and both went their separate ways. Diddy got back together with his ex, Kimberly Porter, for a period. Lopez married backup dancer Chris Judd in September 2001, although they divorced in 2003. My last marriage made me very cautious to kind of fall in love with anybody. 
you know, and I know it may not seem like that to people, but too bad. Before her marriage ended, Lopez entered a relationship with Ben Affleck. Even as the Benefer saga came to define her love life, Lopez received questions about Diddy. Lopez often described Diddy as a friend and mentor in interviews that admittedly played differently through a modern lens. He helped me a lot. He was kind of like a mentor in a way, um, not a mentor, but like guided me. You know, right. he was, it, you know, he had a rough way of doing it, but he did, yeah, <laughs> he did I didn't, guide me. I didn't. Still, one can see how Diddy influenced Lopez's career and business instincts. Like Diddy, Lopez didn't stop with music, launching beauty and fashion lines. You've got a, you've got a surprise for these guys. You're gonna let them try. I do, I do. You know, um, I have my new clothing line. Lopez wasn't just an actress, dancer, or singer. She was a brand. Between Lopez's media ventures and new romances, her relationship with Diddy became an afterthought. Diddy still came up on occasion. In 2015, Wendy Williams asked Lopez if she would ever get back together with Diddy. I was telling you that I could always see you getting back with Puffy in a little way. <laughs> Let's just say Lopez's mother did not approve. The two nonetheless seemed to be on good terms in 2018 when Diddy attended Lopez's All I Have Vegas party. During the 2020 pandemic, Lopez and Diddy participated in an Instagram Live dance-a-thon charity. <laughs> After Lopez rekindled her relationship with Affleck in 2021, Diddy seemingly threw shade with a throwback photo of himself and his ex on Instagram. After deleting the pic, Diddy stated, quote, I don't have nothing to say about her relationship or her life, calling Lopez his, quote, friend. Although there seemed to be no ill will, Lopez's relationship with Diddy was put under a microscope again with the release of her 2024 documentary, The Greatest Love Story Never Told. In the doc, Lopez said she, quote, was never in a relationship where she got beat up, but had, quote, definitely been manhandled. It is not that simple, right. you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. There's something good that. about this person. Yeah. I'm trying to help this person. And sometimes it's the broken parts in us yeah. that keep us there. While Lopez didn't name names, it was hard not to think of Diddy as he became the face of an abuse scandal. Part three, bad boy for life. Shortly before Lopez's documentary dropped, Diddy faced a sexual assault lawsuit from his ex, Cassie Ventura. Though Cassie and Diddy did not detail the terms of that agreement, the settlement quickly shuts down the potential for a trial and the process of legal discovery. That's when evidence in the case is often made public. Despite settling out of court, footage of an altercation between Ventura and Diddy effectively destroyed the latter's image. The abuse claims and lawsuits didn't stop with Ventura either. More than 100 people have pursued legal action against the music mogul. The controversy has not only reshaped how the public views Diddy, but has also raised questions about those closest to him. Many now asking how the man who allegedly behaved so abusively Diddy! was able to do it so often Diddy on the left! and for so long. Months before Diddy's arrest, Lopez and Affleck separated. Diddy's longtime rival and convicted felon Suge Knight theorized the FBI found compromising videos of Lopez during a home raid. This is Hollywood. So everybody want to go act like they don't know what's going on. Hold on a second, Shug. you just look, that's Shug, all you got to do is I watch. have... Knight believes Lopez lied during the 1999 gun case, sparing Diddy from prison and selling out Shine. That is supposedly why Affleck wanted out of their marriage, although Knight provided no evidence backing up these accusations. I wasn't there for this proof of it. At the same time, everybody want to look around and act like something going on is wasn't right. It's the facts of life in the industry. Rodney Little Rod Jones has also claimed that Diddy used Lopez to smuggle the gun into the club. Amid Diddy's arrest, an old photo resurfaced depicting him in bed with Lopez, Aaliyah, and several others at a 2000 party. The context of the photo is unclear, but it epitomized a question on everyone's minds. How many people were in bed with Diddy? If the allegations about Diddy's infamous white parties and freak-offs are true, it'd take a village to keep a secret like this under wraps. The culture of silence was colossal. You know, it really protected Sean for a number of years. Lopez has remained quiet thus far, although an insider says she's, quote, horrified by all of the accusations against Diddy. The unnamed source added, quote, she and Diddy had talked about marriage at one point, but she left him for a reason. These two human beings is not like, I'm walking around the house, I'm bad boy, and she's like, there you go. I mean, she has a little bit of edge to her also. Now people want to know why and what she saw. 
we still don't know what Lopez might have seen during those two years. According to the insider, though, quote, there were many wild moments with Diddy. Lopez was apparently afraid to leave Diddy, receiving death threats, and is creeped out that she stayed with him for so long. As highly publicized as their relationship was, many questions about Diddy and J-Lo remain unanswered. The so second way was with you and Puffy? Um, it wasn't, it wasn't like that so much. Was Lopez a victim of Diddy's alleged abuse? Did she witness him inflicting abuse towards others? Was Lopez aware of the sex trafficking and racketeering that supposedly took place? We may never know, unless Lopez is called to testify at Diddy's trial. And I think that's what we avoid a lot of times because it's usually the truth, and the truth kind of is hard to deal with most of the time. For now, the early 2000s seemed like a simpler time when he was Puff Daddy, she was Jenny from the block, and the discharge of firearms was as shocking as celebrity scandals got. When it's all over, whenever that is, whatever happens, it'll be a very happy day once it's not something we have to think about. What do you make of Diddy and J-Lo's relationship? We had this kind of crazy, tumultuous relationship and that ended in, like, a bang, let's say. Scandal is sadly nothing new for Diddy, and as we're about to see, controversy has been following him his entire career. And you've never told the details about it. Welcome to Watch Mojo, and today we're counting down our picks for the most shocking Diddy scandals that have been largely forgotten in the wake of the recent accusations. Puffy gets arrested. Yeah. Number 10, losing the Diddy name. It seems like so long ago when the biggest controversy was his name, or lack thereof, we suppose. Back in November of 2005, a London-based music producer named Richard Dearlove sued Diddy, as he had been going by the same stage name since 1992. Even if you're not good at math, you can see that this is well before Puff Daddy changed his name to P. Diddy in 2001. He even dropped the P in 2005, becoming just Diddy and earning the ire of Diddy. Yeah, it's a little confusing, and that's why Dear Love sued Combs, and won. He was paid over £100,000 in fees and damages, and Combs was banned from using the name Diddy in the UK. Yo, I'm internationally known on the microphone. Number 9. Allegedly Threatening Kirk Burroughs He made you give up your ownership in Bad Boy, right? Back in 2003, Combs founded Bad Boy Records and worked with a business partner named Kirk Burroughs, who served as the company's president and general manager until 1997. Burroughs owned a 25% stake in the record label, but this partnership ended after Combs allegedly threatened him with a baseball bat. So he came into my office one day unexpected, him and Kenny my salary. Burroughs sued Combs for $25 million, claiming that he was coerced to quit the company through threats of physical violence. Diddy, of course, denied the claims. We never got the full truth, however, as the statute of limitations had expired and the case was dismissed. He didn't want to honor me with credit. He started erasing my names off the albums. Number 8. Assaulting Gerard Ricknitzer in August of 2007, Diddy became the target of another lawsuit, this one coming from 27-year-old Gerard Ricknitzer. Diddy was allegedly talking to Ricknitzer's girlfriend outside a Hollywood nightclub, prompting Ricknitzer to intervene. When he did so, Diddy flew into a rage, shouting obscenities at Ricknitzer before punching him in the face and sending him into a nearby car. Diddy's team denied the claims, stating that Ricknitzer was never attacked and that he just wanted to cash in on Diddy's fame. However, the rapper settled with Ricknitzer out of court for an undisclosed sum. Ask the clubs, bad boy, that's what's up. Number 7. Assaulting a Football Coach Diddy was arrested yesterday for attacking the strength and conditioning coach. Sal Alosi was the strength and conditioning coach for the UCLA Bruins, a college football team based out of the University of California, Los Angeles. Back in 2015, Alosi had a disagreement with Diddy's son, Justin Combs, who at the time was playing for the Bruins. According to the official report, Alosi kicked Combs out of practice owing to a lack of effort. You're out of shape, you're soft, etc. Diddy then confronted Alosi in his office 
office, physically attacking the coach and swinging a kettlebell at one of the interns. Police saw the security video and arrested Combs, charging him with battery and three counts of assault with a deadly weapon. The charges constitute a felony, but they were later dropped owing to a lack of evidence. He attacked the guy allegedly. Number six, a cheating scandal. And What's I in the book? For many celebrities, a cheating scandal is the absolute worst of it. But with Diddy, it's something we have long forgotten. Combs was with model Kimberly Porter for many years, and the couple had four children, including Porters from an old relationship. In 2006, she gave birth to twin daughters, Delilah Starr and Jesse James. Unfortunately, it was also around this time that she learned a horrifying truth. Combs had been unfaithful and had fathered a daughter with a woman from Atlanta named Sarah Chapman. Chapman gave birth to their daughter while Porter was still pregnant with her twins. Porter learned the truth from a friend and later left Diddy owing in part to his infidelity. This is allegedly a book uh, that was co-written by Kim Porter. Number five, The Assault of Cindy Rueda. Sean P. Diddy Combs is allegedly being sued by his former chef, Cindy Rueda. There have been so many abuse allegations as of late that some people may have forgotten about Diddy's former chef, Cindy Rueda. She first made the news in 2017 when she sued Diddy for sexual harassment and unpaid work. And that same year, another situation happened with Diddy's personal chef. According to legal documents, Rueda complained about the harassment to the estate director, but was subsequently threatened, framed for theft, and fired as a result. Diddy eventually settled with his former chef in February of 2019 for an undisclosed sum. It would be one of the first of many accusations, a snowball effect for the ages. She worked overtime on multiple occasions and was never compensated with the proper coin. Number four, allegedly hiding a shooting. In February of 2024, Diddy was sued by producer Rodney Jones, claiming sexual assault. But that's not why we're here. What some may have forgotten or not even known about is that Jones filed an additional complaint about an alleged shooting. According to the lawsuit, Jones was working inside LA's Chalice recording studio when he heard gunshots. He saw Diddy and his son Justin leave a bathroom, and inside the bathroom was a man bleeding from a gunshot wound. Jones's story clashes with that of the LAPD, which claims that a shooting never occurred at the studio and that Diddy is not a suspect. However, Jones has publicly declared this a, quote, massive cover-up. I think Lil Rod was trying to save face on certain things. Number three, attacking Steve Stout. Cause I can't stop now. It was 1999 and Nas just released a music video for his song, Hate Me Now. Puff Daddy was featured on the track and the video showed the rapper being crucified. However, Diddy demanded his scenes be cut from the public release. They did so, but the wrong edit was accidentally sent to MTV and the channel broadcast the version with Puff Daddy's crucifixion. I was destined to come, predicted, blame God, he blew breath in my lungs. Soon after, Combs burst into the office of Nas's manager, Steve Stout, and physically assaulted him with the help of some bodyguards. He was subsequently sued by Stout. Combs pled guilty to harassment and was ordered to attend anger management. He also settled with Stout out of court to the tune of $500,000. Hey, we got paid off well. Millions? You can say that. Number two, violating labor laws. The biggest class clown on MTV. Not content with music, Diddy expanded his horizons and started a clothing label in 1998 called Sean John. However, it wasn't long before the controversies began. In 2003, the company was accused of violating labor laws and basic human rights at a factory in Honduras. The reports claimed that employees were subjected to mandatory pregnancy tests, worked overtime without pay, subjected to daily body searches, and were forced to obtain passes for the locked bathrooms. The new collection is great. Their wages were also not sufficient, with workers being paid sweatshop wages. Former employee Lita Eli Gonzalez said, quote, we live inhumane lives, a succinct statement for a horrible reality. Guys, he's on us. Number one, the shooting trial. It's to me, more of a blip on my uh, journey to where I was going. Diddy's list of controversies has grown so enormous that most people have forgotten about his highly public shooting trial. It stems from an incident that occurred on December 27, 1999, when Combs was accused of shooting a gun inside a Manhattan nightclub. And this comes about from the victim that was shot 
recently going public saying that Puffy is the person that shot me. Another rapper named Shine, who was attending the club with Combs, was also accused of shooting two bystanders. Combs faced up to 15 years in prison, but he was ultimately acquitted thanks to the help of superstar lawyers Benjamin Braffman and Johnny Cochran, the same man who helped O.J. Simpson get acquitted. Shine was not so lucky, as he was found guilty of first-degree assault and given 10 years in prison. Even you were quoted as saying you thought you were going to be a billionaire rap star, and you ended up behind bars. Can you think of any more scandals? You know, Puffy, you can't be doing that. We're ending things today with a look at all the celebrities who, in one way or another, had beef with Diddy. I never got paid what I was worth and I never got the respect I was worth. Welcome to Watch Mojo, and today we're looking at the notable feuds and hostilities between Sean Diddy Combs and other celebrities in the entertainment industry. Here I am keeping good company with the Drew Barrymore Show, and I don't have 1,000 bottles of lube at the house. I'm not panicking, they are. Wendy Williams. You are exhausting me. Let me tell you something. This week has been hella exhausting. <laughs> Wendy Williams and Sean Diddy Combs have a contentious history that dates back to Williams' days as a radio host in the 1990s and 2000s. We've got a lot to talk about. From relationship rumors to questions over his sexuality, Williams often presented her unfiltered opinions on Diddy's life. It was purported that Combs, unhappy with what was being said, not only sent girl group total to, quote, jump Wendy at her offices, but was later responsible for getting Williams fired. Naturally, this led to long-standing animosity between the two. Williams continued to discuss Diddy over the years, especially on her former daytime talk show. The media personality has stated that she feels, quote, vindicated by the disgraced mogul's arrest. And Wendy, who's long been critical of the disgraced rapper throughout her career and on her self-titled show, I think that he's, like, leading this Playboy lifestyle. Is now sharing her relief to learn of his indictment. Kanye West. The beef between Kanye West and Diddy is mostly rooted in their differing political views and public statements. The conflict came to a head in 2022 when Combs criticized Kanye's White Lives Matter shirts, leading to a heated back-and-forth exchange on social media. That's why you gotta come at me, because part of the deal for you to be a daughter, da, 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 and get out of jail is that you promise that you're gonna go pull my coat co car. Kanye accused Diddy of, quote, being controlled by Jewish people, a statement that was widely condemned as anti Semitic. This controversy led to Combs publicly distancing himself from Yeezy and calling for an end to hate speech. Despite this, Kanye appeared to reference Diddy's ongoing scandal on his remix of future Metro Boomin and Kendrick Lamar's diss track like that. Little Rod. Rodney Little Rod Jones, a music producer who worked closely with Diddy, filed a lawsuit against his former boss in February 2024 following their collaboration on the Grammy-nominated Love album, Off the Grid. The allegations included sexual assault, harassment, and unpaid wages. Claims made by Jones include hidden cameras in the rap mogul's home, saying, quote, Mr. Combs allegedly threatened to eat Mr. Jones's face in order to get what he wants. These serious accusations quickly sparked both a legal battle and a public relations crisis for Diddy. As the lawsuit detailed numerous troubling actions Little Rod claimed were directed at him by his employer, it cast widespread scrutiny on Diddy's current and past lifestyle. The fallout from the conflict would go on to have a significant impact on his reputation. Tupac Shakur The feud between Tupac Shakur and Diddy stemmed from the infamous East Coast-West Coast, Coast hip-hop rivalry of the 1990s. In fact, Tupac publicly expressed his belief that Combs was involved in a 1994 shooting that left him wounded. I have proved things that I could say that would back up my claim, but this is not for the world to know about. A series of confrontations between Tupac and artists from Bad Boy Records only fueled the tension between the groups. The rivalry is often cited as a contributing factor in the murders of both Tupac and Biggie, tragedies that left an indelible mark on hip-hop culture. Diddy's alleged connection to Tupac's death has since been revisited, with Tupac's family hiring an investigator to explore possible links between Diddy and the killing. The family of the late rapper Tupac Shakur has hired a, a team of investigators to look into what they say is a link between Sean Diddy Combs and the murder of the hip hop star in 1996. Mace. Mace you got some holes with 
As one of the original shining stars at Bad Boy Records, Mace had a close working relationship with Sean Diddy Combs, receiving mainstream recognition as Combs' hype man. That relationship eventually soured, however. The main point of contention between the two has been over music rights and compensation. And I never got the respect I was worth. So the disdain that I got for Puff is more like, you trying to keep me here. Mace has gone on to publicly accuse Diddy of exploiting him and other artists. While Mace claimed Combs cheated him with a $20,000 publishing deal and withholding royalties, Combs asserted that Mace owed him $3 million. That's facts. I got the receipt. Second album, you gave money to do a second album, never delivered. Did the album, never delivered, you know okay. what I'm saying? And I'm not going to go back and forth with Mace, you know what I'm saying? I'm not going back and forth with nobody. However, Diddy eventually returned the publishing rights to Mace and several other bad boy artists in 2023. J. Cole the brief bad blood between J. Cole and Diddy revolves around an incident at the 2013 MTV VMA's After Party. It reportedly began when Combs confronted Kendrick Lamar over his control verse. In the verse, Kendrick called out his rap peers, including J. Cole, and declared himself the, quote, King of New York, despite being from Los Angeles. This didn't sit well with Diddy, who allegedly tried to pour a drink on Kendrick's head, although that has been disputed. J. Cole stepped in and a scuffle ensued between their crews. Cole acknowledged the incident in his 2021 track, Let Go My Hand. However, despite the heated clash, there seems to have been no lasting animosity, as both amicably moved on with their careers. But it's clear that there's no hard feelings all of these years later. The Bad Boy Records boss took to Instagram on Wednesday, June 9th, to share a video of him and J. Cole hilariously squaring up with each other on a balcony. Shine. This is someone who destroyed my life. Moses Shine Barrow's hostility towards Diddy stems from a 1999 nightclub shooting in New York which also involved Combs and his then-girlfriend, Jennifer Lopez. Shine, who was signed to Bad Boy Records at the time, was convicted and sentenced to 10 years in prison for his role in the incident. Shine accused Diddy of, quote, ruining his life, claiming that at just 18, the music mogul turned on him by having witnesses testify against him, leading to his imprisonment. I was defending him, and he turned around and called witnesses to testify against me and he contributed, he pretty much sent me to prison. He says Combs used his influence to avoid charges, allowing Shine to take the fall. Upon his release, Shine was deported to Belize, where he now serves as the leader of the opposition in the country's House of Representatives. Suge Knight. As the heads of rival labels Death Row Records and Bad Boy Records, the rivalry between Suge Knight and Diddy is one of the most infamous in hip hop history. The East Coast-West Coast feud went beyond the music, however, with Suge Knight even publicly taunting Diddy and Biggie at the 1995 Source Awards. After many back-and-forth incidents, the rivalry took a dark turn with the murders of Tupac and Biggie, with both Knight and Diddy facing accusations of involvement. They have the memories put up for him because, you know, it really affected a lot of people. Knight, who is serving time in prison, has since cautioned Diddy that his, quote, life is in danger should he also get jail time. Aubrey O'Day. I am a very strict and focused businesswoman because working for Diddy for six years trained me to have to be perfect. Working 20... for Diddy? Absolutely. I love Diddy. Once mentored by Combs, Aubrey O'Day was a member of the girl group Danity Kane, which was formed on Diddy's reality show Making the Band. Conflict arose when Diddy fired O'Day from the group on live TV, citing a clash with the group's image. Since then, O'Day has been vocal about her negative experiences working with Diddy, accusing him of manipulative and controlling behavior. She has shared stories about the toxic environment at Bad Boy Records and has criticized Diddy's management style. Following Combs' arrest on a grand jury indictment, the Danity Kane performer posted that it felt like a win for women worldwide. I feel validated, a win for women all over the world. 50 Cent. Go shorty. It's your birthday. We're going party like it's your birthday. The rivalry between 50 Cent and Diddy has been ongoing for years, with the two frequently taking shots at each other both in the music industry and on social media. It all seemingly began with 50 Cent's 2006 diss track, The Bomb, 
where he insinuated that Diddy was involved in the murder of Biggie Smalls. He scared them boys from the west side of Brigham all. Jump on his ass so we run the hall of Brigham all. 50 Cent has since expanded on their feud, describing Diddy's parties as, quote, uncomfortable. That, that's not really beef, though. That's just competitive. Ah. Energy, Competitiveness. You know? All right, so you and, you and yeah. Diddy, you and Puff cool? No, I don't, I don't really oh, rock with him. Okay, like that. damn. All right. I didn't know what that oh. meant. He's become even more vocal in his criticism of Diddy after the raid on Diddy's homes and his subsequent arrest. Here I am keeping good company with the Drew Barrymore show, and I don't have 1,000 bottles of lube at the house. Adding fuel to the fire, 50 Cent also produced and sold a docuseries to Netflix titled Diddy Do It, which should only further intensify their longstanding tension. Have you been following any Diddy feuds? He Diddy be wanting the body. And you gotta tell him no. Oh, you Lord. got to tell him no. I, I did. I did. Oh, See, I got the receipts for everything I'm telling you. That's why I can yeah, say them yeah, so I need, freely. Kid, kid, I need, kid, I need to know. Well, that's gonna do it for this surprising look at Sean Diddy Combs. I've been Matt from Watch Mojo. As always, thanks for watching. I'll see you next time.